Hello? Oh, I have to take a breath after that. But please help me welcome to the stage Cresha Fairchild. This is another one where I say, oh, I know Roger is seeing this as well. And the emotional authenticity about this film, just everything about it. Thank you so much. We are going to give you the golden thumb from Roger. too long, I apologize that I am very emotional because I had not seen it in too long and some of those people are not with us anymore and you know, like I spoke of, the elephants are gone now, but you really missed the person they were attached to. <laughs> we're going to take the thumb and, and um, water bottle from backstage. We'll bring you a water bottle, we'll bring you a microphone, and we're going to first bring out, here comes Andy with the water bottle, and our... <laughs> Do I have to... We don't have what? No, no. Our, moder our moderator is Dr. Eric Pearson. He's a professor of communication studies and former chair of the communication studies department at the University of San Diego. He is expanding media literacy and its philosophical glue that holds together his multiple strands of scholarly and creative work. And I see him every, uh, is it at Telluride? And at Sundance, oh my God. Cresha, your movie, I can't even think right now. Please help me welcome Dr. Eric Pearson. He's moderating the panel and we're having someone who is um, also a, a very dear person, Nell Minow. She is the contributing editor at RogerEbert.com. She's also Movie Mom at MovieMom.com, and she is a um, film critic, you know, like Flashdance. She's lawyer by day, film critic by night. Please help me welcome Nell Minow. And this film is very important to us for several reasons. Um, one is that we've always tried to be a, a good partner with the Champaign County Alliance for Inclusion and Respect. They, at one, one time it was the Anti-Stigma Alliance. And today we're going to have from there Joseph Omosagi. And he's been working as a community outreach worker and counselor for the past 35 years. In this role, he has had the opportunity to work within the local schools in Champaign County, and he is currently a counselor and psychology instructor at Parkland College. And I don't want to miss, he's also the president of the Champaign County Mental Health Board, and 
All right. <laughs> That's good. Okay, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you all for being a part of this. Uh, this is, for the last 22 years, I've gotten to spend April with you all, and it is so good to be back with everyone again. So thank you for, for coming out. Um, I, I'll start by saying um, the audience makes a difference. I, you know, I saw the film alone to prepare for this, uh, but to share it with you all was a very, very different uh, experience because we were all here together. And uh, so, uh, Krisha, I want to ask you to tell us a little bit about um, the history of the project so that we, we understand where it came from. And I did have, were you involved in the short that came before the no, film? Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, the, um, oh, sorry. Um, uh, the, the eldest grandchild in our family was named Nika, and she was Mensa smart and sassy and, you know, the kind of kid we were in, we took her to Europe when she was six and she was walking around the Louvre recognizing things and talking about how she was going to be an architect when she grew up. And um, when she was 14, she went to a rock concert in Austin and a 35-year-old guy put a needle in her arm. And uh, life was never the same for our family. My father was a doctor, a respected guy who worked for World Health Organization, and, and, and we never thought, never thought that could happen to us. We had drunks in our family, and it was always a secret. We had sneak drinkers. Well, not my great-granddad. He, he had a still down in Texas, and he ended up in the, in the ditch every Sunday morning on the way to church. Um, so that's where it all came from, is that Trey's father was also an alcoholic and an addict, and as he was growing up, adoring his older cousin, he watched her disintegrate in front of his eyes, as we all did. And we stuck by her, and she had three children through the years, and she would get together and, get, and fall apart and get together and fall apart. And so Trey lived through all that. And um, one, actually, it was a Christmas. Um, she had come back and she was on methadone and we all thought she'd be fine, be allowed to be around the children. And one of her children was at the gathering and she, uh, none of this is the actual things that happened. It's the essence of what happened. There's one actual shot in it and that is the point at which they're making her go upstairs and she goes, crosses the room with her arms out and tries to go and hug Trey. That's the one thing that really happened. Um, and we all experienced all of this, and she, a, month, a month later she was dead of an overdose. And Trey locked himself in a room and wrote a script, a feature script, and he had $16,000 he'd saved from his odd jobs, and he got all of his friends and family to come, and we spent 10 days, this is not the movie you just saw, we spent 10 days making a short film because he didn't have the resources to make a feature, and halfway through, he had a breakdown realizing that, and his parents are both therapists, and we went into a room with him, and we went, okay, you can't make the movie you dreamed about, what can you make? He goes, I can make a short. He made the short, he took it to South by, won an award, within four months, he raised the money, enough money to make the feature. And um, all of the people who were in, the, worked on the short, of course, came back, but he was able to flesh it out with more characters this time. Can you tell us who in the movie is an actual family yeah. member of yours? Yeah, well, I, it, the nose is the tell. If you, yeah, <laughs> um, th th there's a shot of my father in a soldier's uniform in the in, in a hallway with the, with the profile. Trey has the same profile. I have the uh, Robin is my baby sister. She's eight years younger than I am. Um, the woman, uh, Vicky, the one with all the dogs with the curly red hair is our older sister, and she was the mother of Nika. Um, and uh, then obviously my mother, and then Trey, not an actor, but stepping in the role of the child who was raised by someone else in the family. In our actual family, I'm the one who raised one of her children. I took her, I took her oldest son in, when I was in my 50s, and he was 10. So that's the family base, and uh, the other thing you need to know that is that in real life, my mother was an alcoholic, and um, Nika 
and the rest of us blessedly. Um, my addiction is clearly I love food. Uh, Robin's addiction is exercise, and Vicky is a smoker. I think we dodged some big bullets. <laughs> uh, Joe, can you help us to, to understand um, how these moments uh, affect families? I, I'm, I'm, as any one of us who've had um, holiday dinners with the, with the family, and unfortunately, we've all sort of experienced the uncle or someone who we're, we're sort of dreading their appearance. And I just wonder how, how we as people who care about them can, can help them. Because one of the things I, I, I thought was interesting was there was, there was this, this that Cresha has to do the work, that Cresha mm -hmm. has to do the work. And I kept thinking, well, there's, there's other people, like what's the work that we may have to do in those situations. Yeah, um, just to start out with, I mean, how many of you recognize your family? <laughs> so we all have family that looks like that. And we all don't do the work that Krisha had to do. And I think we have this expectation that, oh, we see the symptom, but we don't think we're part of the problem. She was a symptom. We are all part of it. We're part of that system. And if we don't take care of ourselves and know that we're part of it, we keep repeating it, and we keep repeating it. I mean, Thanksgiving will come again this year. At this time, we might all really get together. And since we've not gotten together for so long, have you done the work yet? And that's really what we, we're really asking you to, each, each and every one of us to do. That it is not just about the one that we identify, not the Bart Simpson, mm -hmm. but Lisa mm -hmm. also has an issue. Lisa is Robin, the exerciser. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we look at an alcoholic family, we can identify different characters in different shows yeah. and see that, okay, yeah, we know the identified person. Homer drinks a lot, Bart makes the noise, and Lisa wants to be the symbol of everything that's good within the family system. Yeah, because I, I, I thought it was interesting that Doyle, Doyle that's the father, oh, yeah. um, he, he clearly has some issues that the family is not paying Eric, much Eric, attention. You're, you're you, kidding. You think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So can you talk about there, because you know, I, I heard it this time, I didn't hear it the first time I saw the film, but when toward the end when, when she's like, dude, you got some issues too, mm -hmm. and nobody in the house seems to be paying attention to them. Can you, can you talk about how your interaction with, with, with that character uh, worked throughout the film? Well, uh, first of all, I need to say that that character was based on Vicky's actual husband, who was too drunk to be there to help us at any time, and um, a major in denial. He is one of those who is no longer with us. And um, Trey heard of this actor named William Wise from Austin, who was known for improv and had not really had many breaks in film yet, except Richard Linklater had, had put him in boyhood. And so Trey went to meet him, and uh, I can say this now, okay, at the time he had, was still having some of his own issues. He's, he would tell you exactly how many days sober he is right now, the guy who played Doyle. Um, and Trey said to him, I have a, I've given you a framework, and now I need you to bring what you think would, would move this story into the realm of what is more real to your experience, which is like saying to a guy who has been a drinker, Bring it. You got some. You got something you want to bring about what you've experienced. Bring it. So all of our scenes were improvised. Everything that you saw us say to each other was improvised. Wow. He's brilliant. He's a wordsmith, and I knew his actual history, and and I was struggling to not attack him back when he was attacking me. And it was very much like when you have two drinkers in a family and they're talking to each other and one of them has not been called out mm -hmm. and the other one's whole life has been, I'm the fucked up one, I'm the fucked up one. So it was, it, 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 we both felt it was coming from very real places and I think that the audience 
can feel that too. You know. Oh yeah. And, and the Doyle character is a character that many of us know because I mean he's functioning. Mm -hmm. He makes the money. He looks the part that we as citizens of this go 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 capitalist economy raise and pedestal because he doesn't show that other part of him and he shows I mean he shows it but it is not the same way Prisha shows that and so we pedestal these characters and nobody calls them out on it and until we all really do the work and we can just don't say it actually do it will still be on this merry-go-round that never ends. I've got a question um, about your performance. Uh, um, some people have said almost jokingly, this is a horror movie, oh. and I think we all understand why it is. It's got a bit of a horror movie score. It's mm -hmm. not a, a typical indie score. But that first shot of your face is so extraordinary. I want to ask you, what did Trey, as a director, tell you about it? And what were you thinking when you had that expression on your face, which is so uh, terrifying and yet it just enthralling? I was thinking everything. I was thinking everything that had gone on in her life and in the life of her family. And I was thinking it slowly. And I was working hard to not show anything. Because the direction he gave me is, I don't want to know what you're thinking. I just want to know that you're thinking. And when we bookended it with the other shot, he said, okay, this time you can show me a little of what you're thinking. And then I wouldn't be entirely honest if I didn't say, he also told me, you're not allowed to blink. No blinking. To give an actor another thing to focus on keeps them from mugging, it keeps them from doing any number of bad actorly traits. And so I was focusing on being in her reality and not blinking. I, I hate to tell the truth that way, but that was what I was focusing on. The, 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 the idea was he did not want people to know what choices or actions that she made at the end of the movie, he wanted people to be able to choose for themselves to decide what happened to her after the, after the movie ended. Well, I think one thing that's extraordinary about the movie, particularly from a first time filmmaker, is what he doesn't feel he has to tell you. He trusts the audience. We don't have to know the backstory about the relationship with the boyfriend. We don't need to know. And we just get these little glimpses. Was a lot of the um, dialogue improvised as well with some of the younger members of the family? Again, what Trey does is he gives you a, a, a the, the script is always short, not a lot of pages. It's a lot of blocks of description putting you in the place. And he gives you the key dialogue that he wants to happen. And he lets you get there however you want to get there and get out of it however you want to get out of it. And if it's good enough, or it serves the story enough, it, it all stays in. Um, but he, uh, he, um, he's a very trusting, he's always certain that he has the right person in each role. He's so certain of it that he gives you a lot of latitude and he, and he doesn't uh, over direct. He, he, with me, he, he, we had a dial, like an old dial on a, on a you know, it, it, back in the day when the, well, everything wasn't push button, and he would dial me up or down, wow. by, and he would at the end of the scene, and he would just come over to me and blah, 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 back about a third of a click, got it, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, yeah. So he's a very trusting director, and he's certain enough of the story that um, any any always. I mean, I said to him, okay, everybody wants to know this. I had uh, recently moved to Mexico, and I was breaking up a dog fight, and I was badly bitten, and I, a fabulous, valiant Mexican doctor treated me for 30 days every day and did three surgeries trying to save my finger. And in the end, the, the ligament had died, and he had to save my hand by cutting off my finger. And I came home from the amputation, and Trey did not realize 
that that had happened that day. And I got a phone call from him saying, good news, I got all the final money. I've got the crew in line. We're starting in two months from today. And I fell apart and told him what had happened. And there was a not too long a beat, but just the right amount. And he said, Auntie Kita, whenever you're ready, I'm going to call everybody and put them all on hold. Whenever you're ready, you tell me, and that's when we'll shoot it. And I hung up the phone, and five minutes later, I called them back and said, I'm ready. <laughs> Let's do it. You know? So I said to him, what are we going to use as the backstory? Are we going to tell him I broke up a dogfight in Mexico? And he went, we're not going to tell him anything. <laughs> Can we um, take a moment just to recommend his other movie? Oh, God, two movies. Yeah. Okay, so if you like thriller kind of suspense movies, before the pandemic, he made this kind of amazing film called It Comes at Night that is about... Yeah, it's it's little scene because they, in my opinion, they mismarketed it as a horror film. It's it's psychological horror and psychological suspense. It is literally about families in isolation hiding from other people because there has been a viral pandemic. What a concept. Okay. Yeah, and his uh, third film, which did tell you right in Toronto, and I still think is a real classic of about families, is called Waves. Um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful film. Very moving and not as, well, almost as difficult to watch as this one, but not as. And uh, I think both of them are streaming right now. It comes at night and waves. I had a question about the sound. I, I am just, when I was watching it, I, it, it was this, this notion that the sound begins to mimic the sort of chaos and, and gosh, there's a lot of noise in the house over the holidays with just the cacophony. It was just stuff going on. And and did you was that while you were doing it, was that stuff that came later or how did that? Yeah, well first work of all, Trey that? is a music guy. He's had ear, ear earbuds in since he was like, you know, able to crawl. And um, always, always making um, playlists for people and you know, I my whole car I only ever play music that is music that he's given me. He's a genius with the music and he really, really understands it and its power. For an example, the script of Waves to Sterling K. Brown and all these big time actors, he sends a script that is color coded for what sound the person is hearing, what music is playing in the back of every scene. He actually like had it color printed so you see the color of the music so you know what the music is. Um, in this film, there was always music playing and in any scene where there was going to be audio that couldn't be music playing, it was playing until just before action so we were hearing it in our heads. The idea of the cacophony, he got together with Brian McComer, this brilliant guy who did the score. He got together. Okay, here's the way Trey gets together with somebody he wants to work with. The guy was staying in a flat in Toronto. Trey got on a plane and went to Toronto and spent two weeks on the guy's couch. And that, and that, and, and he they just worked solid nonstop, ate their meals, and Trey camped out on the guy's couch. And Brian would be like, hey, maybe we can take a day off. I'm like, Trey, no, 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 we're really in a good groove. Um, they created all of that, and he used unbelievable things. If you knew the things that you were actually hearing, you know, I mean, he was using every kind of small, they went to a pawn shop and bought all the small appliances in the world for the scene in the kitchen where the blender is, is. And that actually comes from a family joke because Robin's husband is um, a smoothie guy and you'll be sleeping upstairs or anywhere in the house. <laughs> the sound of the, the smoothie being made. So that was an in joke. <laughs> the music was always all around us. In the slow motion scene in the kitchen, Trey had bought a turntable so he could play my father's old records the music he remembered from his childhood, and that music was playing while we did the scene because he knew he was gonna use the Nina Simone behind the scene. And we, so every, everyone you saw grooving, they're grooving. And in, in a Trey Edward Schultz film, it may be that way. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna open it up for questions, but while we're the getting folks with mics out there, um, how, how did this, what was your family like after those nine days were over with? 
excited because we had been able to help the, the my dad's the one the one male progeny of my father <laughs> and to possibly become who he was always intended to become. We were really excited. It was while we were shooting it that was very emotionally difficult. Robin and I, she sent her actual husband away. The other guy was an actor. And we shared the master bedroom. We slept in, in the beds that go up and down. We slept in those beds together. We, uh, she would take her bath while I took my shower. We brushed each other's hair. We rubbed each other's feet. We had to because we love each other and it's hard to be that cruel. In a family, you always love someone, but when you're in it, you can be cruel. Well, when we weren't in it, we had to go out of our way to be loving to each other. So after every scene, everybody had to check on Vicky because this was about the, the, the last time we were all together before her daughter was dead. And so she, it was very difficult on her. Very. During, yes, after we felt tremendous relief and we knew Trey was on his way. We did. We could feel it. Sounds like um, just, uh, almost uh, like having a family session for nine days. It, we, we spoke that, those words all the time. It was you, like you we were having... Did a, did a therapist or counselor? Robin is a therapist. Oh, okay. And her husband is oh, a therapist. Okay. So we had two on call. <laughs> so I kind of figured... <laughs> Great. So uh, we'll take um, some questions. Questions I see you, right. I see you right there. Um, so I was wondering, the scene where you uh, were after the, the turkey is dropped and you're in the room and you start s you're scolding the dog and then feel sorry, how did that go about? Because when you're acting with a person, like you, there's a mutual understanding, but when it's with a pet, it's like, that you you're maybe afraid you might actually scare them. So how is that? Okay, for none you? of those dogs were hired dogs. First of all, those were all our dogs, and mine weren't even there. Okay, I had three back in Mexico. Um, that little dog was my mother's dog, and um, one Christmas, Trey was always filming everybody all the time, and this was when he was a teenager. He was sneaking around the house, my sister's house, not this one, a different one in Indiana. Um, after everybody had kind of settled down for the night and making audio of us breathing and sleeping, and he went to the room where my mother was sleeping and he heard her raise her voice and he peeked the camera through the crack in the door. Well, she'd been hitting the liquor cabinet all night, so she had a pretty good, you know, head start. And she wanted this little dog, she wanted him to get under the covers and he wasn't doing what she wanted and she picked up a newspaper and beat him. That woman, that sweet woman, she did that to the dog who was her only companion in life since my dad had died. And Trey was so moved, it was very hard for him to see that. And so he wrote it into the movie and said, we can only do this with Dingo because you are his favorite person on the planet since mom is now gone. And so I held him in my arms right up until we did it and then I put him down and we did it and then I held him in my arms. When Afterwards when he came and laid across my lap, like it was because he understood somehow that there was something that we were doing that was like a game or something and that afterwards I was gonna love on him. I know that sounds horrible, but we felt it was so important that you see that, that, that boundary go down, you know, so. Does that answer your question? Uh, under right balcony here. to your left. You okay. Oh. Wow, that light is bright. <laughs> yeah, I see it. Go ahead. Uh, your performance is incredible. I, I just am amazed by it. Thank you. Um, and I could ask a thousand questions about this movie because it just sounds fascinating how you made it. But I'll just ask, how did you handle becoming the focus of this story, the disruptor, when it was actually another person in your family who had 
caused the disruption and the difficulties? I mean, was it hard for you to, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to simplify, but to be the bad guy in yeah, all this. Yeah, okay, have you ever heard the word codependent? <laughs> I was an adult child of an alcoholic, and so when someone I loved needed me to do something, whatever it was, I felt I could fix it, I felt I could make it work, I felt I had the secret, and if I had failed, it all would have been my fault because I struggle every day with my codependence. Every day still, I'm 71 years old, and I still have to actively work on my codependence. So, um, the person we were the wor most worried about was Vicky, because she's not a professional actor, and I mean, none of them are, but we were worried that it would be very scarring, and so we looked out for her. Well, well. Let's see Robin. Um really jump into that codependency role as she talked to you and talked through what was going on and was it I wanted to save yes. almost I want to save you. Oh I want to save you. I want to I was it Robin it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's about the family and yes you're the what everybody sees. Mm -hmm. However it's it's a generational issue. And and probably, from what you said, Grandpa was the one in the ditch on Sunday? Yeah, that was my great granddad. My oh. granddad died of a stroke at 60 mm. from smoking three packs of cigarettes a day and drinking. He was a, a secret drinker. Okay. So always a bottle say, hidden somewhere. So if we look at the epigenetics behind this, there's a lot. Yep. The story is not just what you saw there. The story was written generations ago. Absolutely, and I, I also have to say, in defense of Robin, because she's my soulmate, mm -hmm. she said to Trey, when she got the script for that scene, mm -hmm. and he went, no, 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 this is what we're doing, because if you weren't a therapist, mm -hmm. and you were in our family, this is what you would be saying, isn't it? So just drop the therapy thing, and imagine you aren't healthy, and do it, and she did. And she did. <laughs> Uh, another question was there from the balcony to your left, right here. Uh, gotcha. Thanks. Okay. Uh, hi, I would love for you to talk about the house that you filmed in because mm -hmm. it's it's it, it's the same as many houses that I've been in, and like I hate that house a lot. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, you you just you just feel the pressure to conform to yeah. what your families are supposed to be in yep. America from the walls. It's yeah. awful. <laughs> yeah. Did you love all the yeah, all the relatives everywhere? It's like when she yes. walks into the bathroom the first time. It's like Jesus. No. Even when I'm taking a dump, my these relatives are all I mean, it's, me. it's in the wall hangings and in the the like the little iron spirals on the stairs. Like I hate every little feature of that house. Okay. okay, so I need to tell you then, when you see waves, he looked very hard to find that obnoxious house, that disgusting house. And if you see it comes at night, he looked very hard to find that house because it is the house that my, grand, my father, his grandfather built. It was as close as he could come. The character named Bud is my dad's name was Bud. Uh, his grandfather died when he was six. And that grief is being processed when he puts that house and that man, and that grief is being processed when he creates the house for waves and when he actually used his own parents' house in Cretia, and he hates it too, but don't tell Robin. <laughs> So the house was a character. But, but cinematically, that was a perfect house with that central kitchen mm -hmm. and uh, the living room right off of it and the, and the backyard. So as, as from the movie, it was great. I, I want to say something because nobody has mentioned the cinematography. And um, Drew Daniels, the cinematographer, I have a wonderful story that, that probably you don't know. Um, Trey did two shorts before the, before the Cretia short. He did two shorts about grief a kid who's like 19, 21, making shorts about grief. And he had a DP that, that he used the guy because the guy came with a camera, because the cameras are expensive. All right, when he got ready to do Cretia, the guy wasn't available, and we were all like, 
whew, I don't really care for that guy so much. And he goes, well, there's only one guy who'll let use his camera. And the guy's name is Drew Daniels. And I'm like, what do we know about him? And Trey's like, I've, I've checked him out. I think we're going to click. And we've been talking a lot. Okay, so I'm at the house, all right, codependent. Mm -hmm. I arrive for the shoot three days early so that I can do all the laundry and change all the beds no. and go to Costco and buy all the food for all the meals. Every morning I made the coffee for everyone. It's yeah, so I'm a work in progress. Um, <laughs> Drew Daniels shows up. I'm at the house. I go answer the door. We have a hug. Trey comes in. They have a hug. Never seen each other before. Drew goes, you got the shot list? Trey goes, right here, buddy. Come on. And he starts walking him through the house and showing him. And Drew's totally, he drops his backpack. He's totally cool, and Trey's like, and, the, 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 and this, uh, and these, uh, and at three o'clock in the afternoon, there's when the light hits. Uh, uh. The other beauty of that house was that Trey knew it. He knew where the light was in the house, which time they had. That, this was shot with two light fixtures. Everything else was available light. That was it, and so. They had this Vulcan mind meld thing happen to them. They, they, he's shot all three of Trey's movies now. He actually just shot something big, and I can't think, oh, I feel bad. He's on his way. Drew Daniels, you'll, you'll be seeing a lot of him. But the mind meld made it so that they knew where they were at every second in time in that house. We would stop a scene and move to another scene because we had to catch the light in that room. And all of us just went with it. We were all living there, you know. They, they, were, they were sleeping dormitory style in that big room with the big TV. I, I would have had my own room and I gave it to my sister and slept with my other sister. They watched movies at night, the night before filming. <laughs> they watched The Shining. <laughs> so there's that horror thing, yeah. Yes. Get them in the mood. Get them in the mood. I have a question On right the floor. Question right here. Go ahead. Well, thank you so much. You really captured the dysfunctional family <laughs> excellently. You're welcome. It really um, it, it moved me so much. Just coming from a family very similar, you know, so many things. And uh, I got sober 30 years ago, and I'm 60 now, and I can just yeah, picture yeah. myself <laughs> at the, having. Nice. Thank you. But I can picture myself having not got sober and been her, you know? I mean, it was sort of like I could really see where the projectile of my life would have went um, had I not done the work, right? And my sister got, uh, she's codependent, but she got quote unquote so sober with me, right? She started her recovery too. So phenomenal. To just thank you. And then why did they feel like they had to keep your name part of it? What's that about? I actually, I, 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 there's a really simple explanation and it always surprises me no one thinks of it. My mother struggles so much to appear to be, I just spoke of her in the present. My mother struggled so much to appear to be with it. She wanted to be, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. And Trey knew that if she saw us calling each other by the wrong names, it would confuse her and drop her out of the scene. We needed her, if she couldn't use her mind, we needed her heart. And we, he knew that her heart would, would divorce from, in, 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 a dementia person is shocked when they realize that they're not all there, all okay. So the reason we all use their names is that. The reason the movie is called that is because it was the working title and when we got to the end of it, every single person Trey knew voted that. Keep it. It's, it's authentic to what you all experienced. Keep it. <laughs> So, and he could also get my permission. Nika was gone. I, he thought about calling it Nika, N-I-C-A was her name. But she was gone, he couldn't ask her. So, that's why. I'm told uh, this will be the last question. All right, we got uh, right back here. Yes, under it's, balcony. Hi, you, you've got a couple buds in your family. My name is Bud, too, hi. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, since this is so based on the emotions Can that, you wave your hand, I can't? Hello. The person He's who's the, speaking, the, there the, you are. I'm sorry, I missed <laughs> yeah. you. Thank Since you. This is uh, so based on the emotions that actually existed in your family. 
Were there times when, when the family members who were actors and actresses broke down and you had to stop or retake, or did Trey mostly incorporate that, uh, that real emotion into the film? It, uh, when you're a director and something real happens, if you stop down, you're an idiot. <laughs> you keep the camera rolling when the real things are happening. The aftermath of the turkey, that we really dropped that turkey. And they really shot everyone's responses. And I still have um, burn marks on my knees to, to testify to it. Um, that it, it, no, he used anything that was real. And then, because he is a good human being, when he did stop down, he was the first person to take that person in his arms. So there was a, it was a ton of hugging. Boy, it would never, we could never shot this during COVID. It, it, we were all, all inside of each other's space all the time, helping each other. Does that answer your question? You're welcome. Well, um, thank you oh. for uh, sharing this time with us. Um, I, and I thank want, you, Joe, for everything that you thank, do. Yeah, thank you for Joe. I want to thank the Alliance for their, their sponsorship. Uh, please, uh, the, the young folks out there have some wonderful artwork to share with you all. So if you have time, you should stop by there and, and take a look at the, uh, the stuff that they have. And thank you. But this was, this was a nice uh, time to share with one another. And so thank you for doing that. So. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.